Well, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jerry Franklin um, to our keynote address. Uh, Jerry received his BS and his MS degrees in forest management from Oregon State University and a PhD in botany and soils from Washington State University. He's worked in the USDA Forest Service Pacific Northwest Station for nearly 35 years as a research, research scientist, project leader, and chief plant ecologist before moving to the University of Washington as a professor of ecosystem science in 1986, where he continues to be employed. He's had a very distinguished career, and his research focused largely on structure and function of forest ecosystem, ecosystem response, responses to natural disturbance, ecology and restoration of frequent fire forest ecosystem and applications of ecological knowledge in policy and management of federal forests. So can we please give Jerry Franklin a round of applause? Well, thank you and thanks for the opportunity to be here. A uh, little change, change of pace. I'm not going to give you a PowerPoint. You can either listen to me or go to sleep. <laughs> Got your choice on that. Uh, also, it's really interesting, uh, the focus on aspen, uh, and to a lesser extent, the subalpine forest. Uh, you know, most of what we are thinking about these days in the Northwest with regards to restoration uh, really has to do with the ponderosa pine forest, or more broadly, the pine and mixed conifer forest. Um, and uh, I don't, not sure, I've even heard ponderosa pine mentioned this morning. Once, maybe once. Well, I'm going to mention it, because uh, I'm going to focus on the dry forest. Whereas, you know, maybe uh, I'd prefer to call them the frequent fire forests. I'll say a little bit more about that. I want you to know right at the outset that I'm defining restoration as restoring degraded systems and landscapes uh, in which resilience is one of the key goals. And uh, basically, uh, uh, I've sort of I've sort of approached restoration the way that it was originally defined in the first draft of the Forest Service planning regulations, and saying that restoration includes activities that assist ecosystems in the recovery of resilience when they have been degraded, damaged, or destroyed, and that enhance the capacity of an ecosystem to adapt to change. Ecological restoration focuses on reestablishing ecosystem functions by modifying or managing the composition, structure, spatial arrangement, and processes necessary to make terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems ecological func ecologically functional and resilient to disturbances expected under current and future conditions. I thought they did a great job. Uh, in defining restoration. Unfortunately, it wasn't in the final version of the regs. Uh, so it goes. Uh, also, uh, very much, you know, I'm in, uh, influenced by the uncertainty that exists in our future. Uh, and it's really interesting uh, because the, the uncertainty has to do with uh, both the environmental and the social, including socioeconomic aspects. And I don't believe, you know, that there's ever, you know, the future is always uncertain. You know, the unknown unknown. Uh, but uh, this century, I think, is extraordinary in the degree of uncertainty that we're dealing with. And that being the case, it would seem to me a prudent resource manager is really thinking about uh, activities uh, and goals that would involve reducing risks. That's certainly one of the things we want to do. We'd like to have fewer risks. And uh, sort of the converse of that, we would like for society 10, 20, 50 years from now to have a much broader array of options 
So we want to reduce risks and increase options. So that's always influencing me as I think about restoration. Uh, structure of my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, what, what uh, a group of us have concluded are principles that need to be followed in restoring resistance and resilience. Uh, and uh, drawing pretty heavily on my experience uh, and a lot of it with regards to the dry forest is reflected in a, a field guide to the restoration of dry forest in Eastern Oregon that we just published. Uh, so a lot of materials drawn from that and uh, probably I've had hundreds of collaborators but uh, in this very practical work, uh, Dr. K. Norman Johnson at Oregon State University has sort of been um, my main collaborator. We have a lot of fun. He's got an economic and policy background. I'm an ecologist, and uh, we really make a very peculiar pair, uh, but one that uh, uh, is a pretty comprehensive view of things. Also, I've had a lot of experience in the last three or four years uh, in dealing with policy uh, as it's thought about and considered at the congressional level. We've been working a lot with uh, members of the Senate, members of the House, uh, with regards to potential legislation having to do with management of our federal forests. Uh, and uh, that's, that's had a profound influence as well. Maybe that'll come out. Uh, I also want to talk a lot, uh, I'm going to talk about the principles, and then I want to talk about particularly collaboration. Because I think uh, the emergence of collaborations, largely locally based collaborations involving a a broad array of stakeholders and most often the agencies themselves are profoundly important, not only in what's happening now, but perhaps uh, profoundly important uh, in what's going to happen in the future. And so I, I want to really uh, stimulate you to think about that, uh, that aspect of what's going on right now. Now, the principles, oh, man, they're, they're, you know, I tell my students, you know, these profound things that we discover are so obvious in retrospect that it really seems dumb. You know, they're, they're, they're no-brainers for the most part. And I'll, I'll just have to ask you to forgive me. I mean, these are all things that I think mo we know. You may not agree with every one of them, but I think, you know, you can intuit that these, these are some basic principles. One of them is not all Western forests need to be restored, or at least certainly not in the same sense, okay? And that was profoundly important for me to get across, for Norm and I to get across to the congressional people that were talking about making law, making policy, with regards to federal management of our forest lands. And they needed to understand that basically you can't have a single policy that works for both frequent fire forests and the more traditional uh, stand replacement kinds of forests. But they need to make that distinction. And so one of the things that we've done in a lot of our policy work, a lot of our restoration work is as a first principle, recognize that uh, moist forests and dry forests are different. And that a single policy, a single generic approach or philosophy won't work for both of them. When I talk about dry forests, what I'm talking about is forests on sites characterized by frequent fire regimes. And in fact, they're probably better called frequent fire forests or sites subject to frequent fire. And I say that because not all frequent fire forests are dry forests. In the West, they generally are. They're hotter and drier parts of our forest landscape here in the Intermountain West. But 
one of the most distinctive frequent fire forests is neither dry uh, nor low in productivity, and that's longleaf pine. And I've spent a lot of time in longleaf pine over the last 20 years, if you can believe it. And uh, it's really been very useful for me to understand the principles that are as applicable to longleaf pine as they are to the ponderosa pine forest. So, frequent fire forests are fundamentally different from most other temperate forests. And it's stunning to me that foresters have never really made a point about this. They kept trying to take frequent fire forests and make them into even age stands. Okay, they did it with longleaf by making pine plantations we did it, uh, of course, here in the West as well. Now, those kinds of forests have some very characteristic structural features. Uh, and historically, you know, the most predominant condition in those forests, not the sole condition, but the dominant condition were stands that were of very low density and dominated by a, a small population of large and old trees. And they've been dramatically modified by activities over the last hundred years, out here in the West at least. Uh, and very clearly those kinds of forests uh, need restorative management of one kind or another if we want goals such as resiliency and functionality. The moist forests, on the other hand, are forests on sites characterized by infrequent stand replacement disturbances. And some of them are very long lives and, of course, produce incredible fuel loadings. That's the Douglas fir hemlock forest that Jim was showing you. Some are very short-lived with slowly developing fuel loadings. That might be lodgepole pine. Uh, and subalpine fir ingle and spruce forests are another example of forests that are characteristically subject to infrequent stand replacement kinds of disturbances that you've already been hearing about today. Now, fuel treatments are just not ecologically appropriate in those kinds of infrequent stand replacement type of forest ecosystems, except in wooing. You know, where you're dealing with urban environments, okay, that's appropriate. But if you think, you know, that's obvious that they're not appropriate, you need to talk to some of your fire and fuel specialists, all right? Because they think that where there's a lot of fuels, you always need to be treating those fuels. And, of course, if you do, you create systems that are totally novel systems and certainly don't have the kind of functionality, certainly don't provide... Uh, the biodiversity habitats that we expect of them. So what I had to tell, what Norman and I had to tell the senator and the congressman was, if you want, in effect, to protect old growth forests and trees, you cannot have a single policy. Because in the moist forest, you're perfectly valid in recognizing the old forests, drawing a line around them, walking away from them, maybe actually doing fire suppression on them, to try to sustain them for as long as you can. Essentially, something will happen. But in the dry forest, even where you have a lot of good structure, even where you have populations of big old trees, if you don't do active management, to restore processes in those systems, you're going to lose those forests. And their old growth conditions have to be restored and sustained by active management. Now, I made a point about this simply because it is important to recognize that all Western forests do not need to be restored and do not, or at least do not need to be restored in the same way. And, uh, that needs to be recognized. And I also made the point because we have been criticized in massively for dividing the forest world into two. 
you know, basically dry forest and moist forest. And I can't tell you how much criticism we've had for that. But it has to do with the sort of thing that you need to do in developing policy. You need to recognize very important categories of things. Senator Wyden told me one time, Jerry, tell me about old growth, but I don't want you to tell me there are 160 different kinds of old growth. I can't deal with that. So I, in this case, we've given him two kinds of forest to deal with. And interestingly, it looks like, in fact, he may actually deal with that degree of complexity <laughs> in his legislation. We'll see. Second principle, focus on restoring ecosystem structure and function. Take a holistic approach to these restoration activities. Fire and fuel treatments, if that's what you focus on, marginalize other values and often do great things for firefighters, but nothing actually for the forests themselves. And a great example are the shaded fuel breaks in California. I've stood in a landscape in the Plumas National Forest, and the forest is all burned down, except, of course, the shaded fuel break, which is green. Now, that's great. It worked from the standpoint of firefighters, but it did nothing to protect those forests. So the point I'm making here is simply we need to be restoring ecosystems not, in fact, trying to achieve some singular objective. And in the process of restoring ecosystems, we will deal with the forest health issues. We will deal with the fire issues. But we have to do that. Anytime we approach a forest with a singular objective, we marginalize other values. Sometimes, we completely eliminate those other values. And uh, basically, on the federal lands, we need to stop doing that. And that's true. Uh, it was true in the old days when we emphasized timber. It's true now when we're very focused on fire and fuel. And it's, as I tell the environmentalists, it's equally true if we just focused on creating habitat for the northern spotted owl. Those kinds of singular objectives don't work. They marginalize other important values. So focus on restoring ecosystems. Third, plan and implement at the landscape level. Again, I'm telling you, these are, are really simplistic, but uh, they're so often ignored. Now, we've understood that from a, for quite a long time from a fire and fuel perspective. We understood but if you just go out and do a patch here and a patch there and a patch here, it isn't going to make much difference in terms of how fire behaves in that system. Okay? And that you really have to look at a much broader scale. But it turns out that we have to be thinking at the landscape level in all aspects of restoration. And uh, a really good example uh, for us in the Northwest as we deal with the forest, the dry forest on the eastern slope of the Cascades was the need for retaining some larger landscape level patches uh, in an untreated condition. Why do we need to do that? Well, we needed to do that because that was the kind of habitat that the northern spotted owl and its prey species require. And like it or not, historic or not, we have to, in restoring those dry forest landscapes, to provide for that listed species. Now, the reality is we probably need to be doing that kind of thing everywhere. That essentially, these landscapes typically did have these areas that were denser kinds of forest. So the principle here is that you probably shouldn't ever be treating everything in a landscape. But uh, this was a, a specific example of where we had to be thinking, where are those denser forest patches going to be? 
on this landscape, the bulk of which we intend to restore through a variety of silvicultural treatments. Okay? Not clear cut, but restore the forest conditions in here. So th that's exactly what we're doing. And interestingly enough, that is the strategy that the Fish and Wildlife Service has adopted for the dry forest under the new recovery plan for the spotted owl. Fourth principle is one that's related, and that's the notion of providing for heterogeneity at all spatial scale, from the stand to the landscape. All right? And again, uh, you know, this really goes against the principles of production forestry that all of us foresters were taught in forestry school. Okay? Uh, now, the patches for spotted owls and goshawk illustrate the point already at the larger scale. But at the stand level, again, we need to be seeking heterogeneity, not uniformity. And this is really very difficult to both persuade people about, particularly professional foresters, and to actually implement. Foresters are basically trained in an agronomic approach, okay? One that you would use in a cornfield. And so, you know, what was the principle uh, in forestry? Room to grow and none to waste. Homogeneity, uniformity in the distribution of trees over the landscape. Well, the reality is, essentially, no, none of our natural forests are homogeneous. They're all highly heterogeneous. And a lot of the complexity that we talk about is not just complexity in different structures, you know, different sizes and conditions of trees and snags and down logs, but it is in the way that they are spatially arranged. Okay, so spatial arrangement of structures is as important as the diversity of structures themselves. And natural forests have incredible spatial heterogeneity. And Jim was beginning to point out some of that in his presentation. One of the really neat things that's happened is we have now actually developed a credible methodology for creating heterogeneity. Heterogeneity that resembles the natural heterogeneity of stands using silvicultural methods. Now this is We've had no tools in forestry for creating heterogeneity. Can you believe it? We've had no tools at all. We don't even have metrics for it in traditional forestry. And, you know, some of us have tried for several decades to begin to, to try to get people to incorporate heterogeneity, but we've had no tools. And so, you know, what have I been telling people? Well, leave some, leave some areas untreated, some skips. Leave some gaps. Or create some openings, and then, you know, have your, your thinning prescription or your, your partial cutting prescription in between. So some skips and some gaps, and uh, some thinning, maybe vary the thinning if you can bring yourself to do it. Well, that's not very useful direction for people. Not even when you say, well, try 15% skips and 15% gaps and then treat the rest or something like that. Because what I'm asking them to do is sort of, you know, can you somehow uh, uh, channel Jerry out there and doing your silvicultural prescriptions? And I've had environmentalists say, well, Jerry, I'd trust you to do that, but I just don't trust the Forest Service to do that. Well, we have a new methodology now that's just emerging. Anyone that wants the key paper, uh, I'll be glad to send it to you. Just send me an email, and I'll give you my email address before we're done so that you can do that. But it's a method that a couple of young foresters have come up with, uh, Andrew Larson and Derek Churchill, uh, and it's based on a clustering algorithm. It's based on the notion that forests are composed of clumps of trees of various sizes 
or numbers of individuals. And basically what they do is they de use natural stands as reference stands to get some idea of what is the, the distribution of clusters uh, in a forest. And then use that as a guide in going out and marking the forest. And marking then not just individual trees, but in fact marking clumps with di not differing numbers of individuals. Well, it's a wonderful technique that actually produces a spatially heterogeneous outcome that is comparable to what we see in nature. And therefore, will fulfill some of the functions that natural heterogeneity fulfills in these stands. And it's quantitative, and it's teachable, and it's adjustable in terms of different forest types, uh, et cetera, so that we can finally begin to go out and begin to implement ecologically appropriate heterogeneous silvicultural prescriptions. They call it ICO, incidentally. Individuals, clusters, no, pardon me, individuals, clumps, and openings. Uh, and it's, it's really worked. And interestingly, the space is as important as the clusters of trees. The way that open spaces are arranged in stands is as important as the actual clumping of the trees. Quantitative, applicable, teachable approach. I'll just say, ask the, the question, does heterogeneity matter? Well, it certainly does. And there's a body of literature that will make that very clear. Fifth principle, excuse me. Retain and restore old tree populations and other foundational elements of the stand. And there are things out there that are really important in these dry forests. Some of the other foundational elements might be, in fact, things like large old snags. They might be things like uh, large and old hardwoods. Uh, which are also trees, but sometimes foresters have concluded hardwoods are not really trees, and therefore they don't count. So, larger old trees of fire and drought tolerant species are the structural backbone and resilient elements of most frequent fire or dry forest ecosystems. They are. You know, they are the key elements, and they are the ones that have the, the resilience. And of course, the big old trees produce the big snags and the big down logs. Old trees are not simply young trees enlarged. You know, I've had a real problem with foresters because somehow they think, you know, that large trees are a substitute for old trees. And in some limited senses they are, but for the most part they're not. Old trees differ in many important ecological attributes. They have thick bark, higher forest fire resistance. They have a much greater percentage of heartwood, decays differently, different crown architectures, large branches, typically have decadent features. Oh my goodness. Rot, ca cavities, brooms, yeah, that's exactly what they've got. Now, interestingly, not only are they the, the structural backbone of these forests, but they're also the social icon. What is it that will arouse a local population of people more than the notion that the Forest Service is going to cut down all of the big orange bark pines? You can really get into trouble. Uh, when you start doing that. So they're, they're both environmentally critical and socially critical. And furthermore, old trees are historically at low levels. In fact, in much of the Intermountain West, we don't even have old tree populations anymore. Now, we're fortunate on the federal lands in the Northwest that we still typically have stands with residual populations of big old trees 
around which we can build our restoration strategy. So uh, you know, they're really important. And so, you know, our restoration strategy is to retain and nurture these trees wherever they occur, regardless of their size. So we're going to keep the little old trees as well as the big old trees. Uh, and we have no diameter limit. And basically the Forest Service, uh, which did something very judicious 20 years ago, they instituted a 21-inch diameter limit in the dry forests of the Pacific Northwest. And it was because when the Northwest Forest Plan was adopted 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago now, uh, the environmentalists went in and saw the regional forester and said to him, you know, we're worried. We think you're just going to move all of your operations over to the east side, cut down all the forests, all the pine forests, and so he said, well, what we'll do is we'll have a 21-inch diameter limit. So we won't cut any trees over 21 inches in diameter uh, as an interim measure for a year or two until we have our new plans in place. Well, that interim measure is still in place nearly 20 years later. And as we go about our restoration, it is a huge problem. Because guess what? In the mixed conifer forest, you can grow a pretty good sized green fir or white fir in 100 years. And so what are some of our biggest problems in terms of the old trees? They are these incredible young white firs, grand firs, Douglas firs, that have grown up under them and around them and provide competition and fuel ladders. Those got to go. In any kind of a restoration strategy, those have to be removed. And so basically, our approach, keep the old trees, nurture them through the removal of fuels and competing vegetation, and don't be concerned if sometimes you have to take larger diameter trees in order to achieve your objectives. Old, not old ones, but young ones. So, emphasis is on old and not large, but I will acknowledge that large structures can be important. I also just wanted to comment on the amazing consistency in terms of the number of big old trees that were in the historic pine dry mixed conifer and moist mixed conifer stands in the Northwest. It's stunning, you know, how absolutely consistent those population levels were, which was on the order of uh, 14 to 22 trees per acre, which consisted of essentially 80%, 90% of the basal area in those stands. Six point, learn from the past, but look to the future. And I've already alluded to that. We're not going to try to restore, strictly speaking, an historical condition. You know, really, uh, you can't go home again, and you probably don't really want to. And in most of our restoration, we don't really want to. So we're not seeking to restore some historic condition. We may even be outside the historic range of variability, but probably not. Uh, we are, however, going to be learning from natural models about stand and landscape level conditions that were resilient. And that model of low density stands dominated by large diameter trees is going to be at the center of what we're thinking about. We are going to be adapting to current goals, which include resistance and resilience under current and anticipated future conditions. Nice thing about dry forest restoration is it's exactly the first step that you should be taking in terms of adapting to climate change anyway. So it's a win-win kind of a strategy. Uh, and uh, we are going to be accommodating 
existing biodiversity and stakeholder goals. And one example that I could give you is uh, one of the groups that we worked a lot with was the, the Klamath tribe who were very concerned about their mule deer populations. And because of that, they're very concerned about bitter brush and being sure that the restoration programs and particularly the re, the re, uh, re, return of fire does not result in essentially dramatic reductions in the bitter brush populations in their stand. So that's very much a social goal. It's very consistent uh, with what we want to do ecologically. Seventh principle, and I'm not going to go into detail on this at all, restore fire. Restore fire to our landscapes. There's no alternative to that. We either do it through our policies or nature will do it for us. These are basically fire frequent landscapes and they're not going to be less so in the future. They're going to be more so unless we simply cut down all the forests and pave them over. Now you can do that but I don't think that's where we want to go. Probably a different policy for our managed landscapes than our wild landscapes in terms of what we do about fire and how we use it. Eighth, understand that the job is never done. Stewardship is forever, especially in fire frequent landscapes. Again, that's obvious to you. It is not obvious to politicians. It is not obvious to the public. It's not even obvious to many of the people in the media. They don't understand. This isn't something you fix and you get to walk away. It is something, in fact, you have to participate in in perpetuity insofar as that applies to humankind. We have to make the public and decision makers understand the need for that continuing activity. Okay, the last principle here has to do with engaging the stakeholders in all aspects of restoration. And that brings me to the second emphasis that I wanted to make in this presentation, which has to do with the importance of collaboration. If you look at the Intermountain West today, essentially nothing is going on on federal land without strong stakeholder support, one thing. And the second is activities that demonstrably have significant ecological content and benefit. Basically, nothing's going on out there on the federal land that doesn't have those two things. It's got to have ecological content, and it's got to have strong stakeholder involvement. Now, that involvement can take many, many different forms. But that's just the way it is. And unfortunately, leadership in our federal agencies is at an all-time low, so far as I can tell. And what leadership there is in the agencies is basically in the more localized elements of it, at the level of the district, at the level of the forest, occasionally at the level of the region, and almost never at the level of headquarters. Okay? And so that makes these collaborations incredibly important in stimulating and enabling the important activity that needs to take place. Locally based collaborations are emerging as the real spark for getting activities done in what has been a highly litigated environment. We all know that. Nothing's been happening because everything gets litigated. That provided leadership and created political support for undertaking important management activities, especially in the Intermountain West and more recently in the Sierra Nevada. Now these collaborations have to have certain things to be credible. One of them is they have to be broadly representative of stakeholders. They really have to have interests that have significant conflict. 
participating, and collaborating. And they're stimulated by the recognition of common interest on the part of those stakeholders and the notion that if nothing gets done, it's not to anybody's advantage. And it's to everybody's advantage for something to get done. These collaborations are strongly science-based. They vary in terms of how that's represented, but there is no question without scientific justification for what is done, uh, it's not going to happen. And as I said, these collaborations provide leadership, including empowering local agency personnel. And it really makes it possible at times for agencies to do what they want to do, but simply don't have, in one way or another, the resources or capacity to make it happen on their own. These local-based collaborative efforts have great political strength. And when a local group agrees on a course of action, it's really hard for politicians to do anything other than support it. I mean, you know, all politics is local. And if you have a diverse group of stakeholders who have come together and said, you know, these things need to happen. We need appropriations for these things. It can happen. And this is exemplified. Look at what happened a couple of, con a couple of sessions ago. They created the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program which many of you are almost certainly involved in in one way or another, in which basically groups around the country competed for funding for collaborative restoration projects. And it was so effective that Congress decided it wanted to do it again the next year. This was one place where you actually had bipartisan support. That's almost... That's almost an oxymoron, bipartisan. So, and those are congressionally mandated and funded. Now, I use that not as an example to say that that's enough to get things done, but simply that these collaborations have tremendous political clout. Now, we would agree... Uh, we would argue, pardon me, Norm and I would argue that these collaborative efforts are critical to future management on federal forest lands. And uh, first of all, I think this is the primary way that citizens are actually going to engage with policy on their public land in the future. Uh, I think Gifford Pinchot would be very pleased with this development uh, because he was if nothing else, a superb politician. And he really believed in the necessity for his agency to be engaged with the citizens. All, but in those times, of course, the citizens you engaged with were the important business interests, etc. Today, all of our society engages in these things and is intending to be heard and is intending to have a say in it. So I think Pinchot would be very uh, strongly approve this kind of a development. Secondly, we would argue that collaborative citizen involvement is going to have to extend much beyond what it's done so far, which is largely to be simply be involved in the planning phases. Obviously, some of the groups are moving on. Uh, this is a part of the CFLRP program in the planning the monitoring activities. But I think, you know, basically uh, collaborations are going to have to be involved in all of the activities through implementation, through monitoring, through the interpretation of the results of the monitoring program. And I've thought a lot about that because one of the major challenges in monitoring besides getting it to happen in a credible fashion, is interpreting the results. I don't know if you realize it or not, we don't have the science to interpret the results. Let's say a treatment reduces the surface 
organic matter by 2%. What the hell does that mean? You know, we don't know. And so basically all the participants have to be involved in assessing what comes out of the monitoring program, interpreting what it might mean for changing management and the monitoring program uh, for it to be really acceptable. I also really think that in the end, citizens have to be involved more in actually carrying out many of the management and monitoring activities. I don't know how we do that, but I would love to see the environmentalists putting their muscle where their mouth and money on it. I'd love to see that, where you know we're short on bodies, we're short on money to get a lot of important work done out there. And I think you know participation has to involve more than just sitting in a room. It has to be involved in actually going out and carrying out some of the activities. And stewardship contracting is obviously a step in that direction. One last thought I want to leave you with, and this is speculative on my part, but I'm really concerned about the future of our federal forest lands. Uh, we have an increasingly urbanized population in the United States uh, that really doesn't identify closely with the federal forest lands. Uh, and in fact, you know, as with their food, they don't know where their food comes from. They don't really know where their water and their wood comes from as well. And I'm, I'm really concerned that in that society, which is less and less connected with these lands and with the services they provide, and which is stressed from the standpoint of finances, that uh, you know there's going to be a lack of advocacy. My thinking is that these local-based collaborations and constituencies very possibly could become the primary advocate for our federal forest lands in that highly urbanized future. And I look at our president, you know, liberal Democrat, but he's a kid from Chicago. We can't get a picture of him in the woods, okay? Uh, it's just not part of what he thinks about, what's high on his list of priorities. And if you take that, you know, as symbolic of where we might be going, these forest lands are going to need constituency that care about them, that understand them, that participate with them. So a couple of cautionary notes. Not all collaborations are successful, and not all regions have successful collaborations. One of the early ones, and a very prominent one, was the Quincy Library Group. The Quincy Library Group has collapsed, uh, and it's going away as a strategy, as a collaboration. And the problem there, in my opinion, was that they had no capacity to grow, to evolve, to change. Okay, they had a plan at one point in time they had no process by which they could go back and revisit that, incorporate new science, incorporate new concerns, incorporate uh, new societal goals. And they broke because they had no capacity to grow. That's an important lesson for collaboration. Uh, there are other concerns with collaborations. They can become very uh, inward-looking groups as well. They can become, you know, very, uh, very comfortable social groups uh, that are very comfortable with each other uh, and maybe uh, lose sight of, you know, what their larger objectives are. So we need to have a process uh, that periodically looks at is what is getting done from a total third party perspective so that we can be sure that these things don't drift away from uh, what we really want them to be doing. 
Um, I think maybe, you know, I'll just leave it. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. It's interesting to me that we have no successful collaboration in the productive forests of western Washington and western Oregon. Isn't that interesting? The most productive forests of all our federal forest lands, and we have no successful collaboration. Uh, we have no, in fact, forward movement in those forests. Uh, and probably one of the reasons why you have success with these in the Intermountain region and we don't have success for them in the Douglas Fir region is because the stakeholders do not understand what is at risk. They, are, they don't feel the threat, the dangers that you recognize now collectively in these dry forests and the need to do something about them. So, but uh, hopefully, you know, that'll change. I think maybe uh, I won't say anything more about adaptive management unless one of you uh, asks exactly the right question about it. Okay, I just want to finish up at this point. How much restoration can we really get done? in the Intermountain West. Well, I got to tell you, there's a lot of momentum. There's a tremendous amount of momentum throughout the West. And the scale of the activities that are being proposed is two orders, three orders of magnitude beyond what we were talking about 10 years ago. We're not talking about 1,000 acres. We're talking about 10,000. 50,000 acres uh, in these various planning areas and dealing with them. So I think we could get a lot done. And I think about my mother's, one of my mother's many sayings to me, where there's a will, there's a way. And I would suggest here where there is sufficient will, uh, there is a way. And so, you know, the key is uh, whether we as citizens have enough energy uh, to, to make, uh, to do enough restoration to really make a significant difference in what happens in the next 10 to 20 years with regards to restoration. I think the potential is there. To restore everything? Hell no. It's not, it's not in the cards to uh, do a significant amount with a lot of focus on the areas of highest priority, I think that's very definitely a possibility. Many of these forests can carry the out-of-pocket costs of treatments. A lot of them can't, but many of them can, and that's certainly true for us in the Pacific Northwest. Once we don't have to worry about uh, uh, things other than the appropriate kind of ecological treatment. And we're not worrying about constraints like, well, you can't cut that 21 inch diameter white fir that's tucked under that big ponderosa pine. I think a lot of the forest can carry it if credible restoration treatments are proposed and implemented. I think collaborations are an essential element in what we're gonna get done. And I think we need to focus on what we can accomplish in the next one to two decades. Because after that, it may not matter very much. I mean, we see we're losing resources at the scale of certainly hundreds of thousands of acres every year. Interestingly, Norm and I are telling foresters these days, you gotta stop worrying about what's your goal 100 years from now. And you've got to worry about where this system's going to be 10 years or 20 years from now. That's what's really important. And if we can, in fact, restore a significant part of our dry forest landscape in the next 10 to 20 years, think of the options that society will have at that point in time in terms of what they do. Okay. Okay. 
I'm an optimist. I have to be. Uh, it's just in my nature. Uh, I couldn't live without being somewhat optimistic. I just remind you, who would have thought? Who amongst us that are old enough to go back that far uh, would have thought, say, in 1980 that we were going to stop cutting old growth forests and old trees? Who would have thought? And here we are. That's where we are. We aren't going to cut old growth forests anymore. We aren't going to cut big old trees anymore. I'm not saying not one. I'm saying as policy. We're not going to do that. Who could have believed that we could make that kind of change in a matter of 20 or 30 years? We can make that kind of change in these dry forest landscapes. So with that, I think I'll end. Now, if I haven't stimulated some controversy out of one or two things that I said, I'd be stunned. So, who would like to weigh in? Yeah. <coughs> you made a comment about halfway through about um, uh, firs and Douglas fir. And I wonder if you could, in your estimation, in dry inland forests, what's the, what's the historic role of Firs and Douglas fir, and then, then the second question of large firs and Douglas fir. Well, uh, certainly, you know, there were in the mixed conifer forest, the dry mixed conifer and the moist mixed conifer forest, there certainly was a short needle component. You know, it varied from place to place which species it was, but in our forest uh, up in Oregon, eastern Oregon, was typically. Uh, grand fir, white fir, and Douglas fir, okay? And uh, in those historic forests, they were certainly present. Uh, there were patches in which they were dominant, uh, and there were certainly some of the old, big old trees were composed of those species. And in our restoration treatments, we don't attempt to eliminate those, and we absolutely do keep big old Douglas firs and white firs, just like we keep the big old pines. They were, but they were a much smaller percentage of the stand. And interestingly, it's in the mixed conifer forests where these have become abundant that we really have our highest priority. Because think about it. The mixed conifer forests are more productive than the pure pine forest. I mean, there's more moisture there. They are more productive. And they're not only more productive, which means that they generate fuels much faster, but they've got these incredible, perfect fuel ladders known as a true fir or a Douglas fir. So not only do they accumulate fuels fast, but the fuels are structured in such a way that it is a uh, a stand replacement fire set to happen. And so it's typically in the mixed conifer forests, which paradoxically haven't really missed that many cycles of the fire, that the highest priorities for restoration actually are. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I just wonder if there's any role for them in, in Ponderosa or, or those kind of forests. Or, or are they exotics in your mind? Are they what? In the, in the, in they the, were there. Okay. They were there. They were. They were, but in very, very low percentages. Other questions that put you all to sleep. Okay. Yeah. All right. I got, I got the sixty-four thousand dollar question. If you're ready. Ready. Okay. <laughs> Do you see? the wood product industry as being a real mover and contributor to forest restoration and forest heterogeneity. Absolutely do. Yeah. Absolutely do. And you know, one of the things that I've become aware of, and boy, this has been an evolution for me, is that, you know, as an ecologist, I'll just think about this as an ecologist. To hell with human humans, okay? 
other than I got to deal with it. As an ecologist, I need uh, a skilled woods workforce and a wood product industry that can help subsidize my activities in restoring and sustaining those systems. So I see essentially uh, a wood products industry as being an essential element of our forest stewardship. And I believe very strongly, you know, that we need to uh, be working to sustain those. And that says nothing about the broader fact that it's absolutely true that you have to have a society that's supportive of these kinds of activities or they won't happen. I tell my students every day that forestry is a social science before it's anything else. Why? Because people are going, society is going to make all the important decisions about what happens out there. And I tell them that any policy has to be socially acceptable to be sustainable. Doesn't matter how good it is, how scientific it is, if it's not socially acceptable, it's not going to work in the long run. So, Absolutely. So my, my, my clients, I've always viewed as the forest and the trees. But to get the best deal for my clients, I've got to also work to do good things for the human society in which they're embedded. Okay? So do you see um, this changing the, the current paradigm we have for the wood products industry? <coughs> Uh, lots of logging roads and large mills and lots of transportation adding to our warming climate or do you see a different model where there's much more smaller trans uh, portable mills or maybe more local collaborative mills or something like that? All of the above. You know, basically, you have to understand the corporate wood products industry is out of here. Okay, they're gone. They've gone to the Southern Hemisphere. They've gone to Australia, to New Zealand, to Chile, to Argentina, to South Africa. And they aren't coming back, at least not for several decades, OK? This is the corporate wood products industry that is producing the majority of the wood fiber-based industries globally. So what, what do we have to do? We have to nurture in every way possible locally based industries that are largely serving local and regional markets rather than global marketplaces, okay? So I see us very much, you know, the ideal situation as I look around the West are these communities that are fortunate to have a family owned mill that basically views itself as part of the essential social structure of that community. Sealy Lake has one of those. Stevenson, Washington has one of those. And these are companies that aren't trying to make 10 or 12 or 14 percent return on their capital every year to satisfy Wall Street. Okay? They do, however, need to make a profit. And they do need to have a marketplace. So, you know, what you do is you lead me into the globalization that's occurred and its consequences for us. And we have a really difficult time maintaining a viable wood products industry in the face of that kind of globalization. But we can, and we must do that kind of thing. And there are many models for it. But I like that family-based mill best of all. Uh, it seems to work. Thank you, Dr. Times. Let's give Jerry a big round of applause.